I was thinking on, on coming down on the train um, that I, was, I, I was, wasn't quite sure uh, what I was on about, really. I'm an economist. I'm not a humanitarian. Um, uh, I'm going to talk on open access and multimedia monographs in the Digital Humanities Conference. I'm not sure that I know what digital humanities are. I don't know what open access is, and I don't know what a monograph is. So either this is a really, really fun time to be talking about these types of things, because they're not well defined, or you've got entirely the wrong speaker, <laughs> or a bit of both. Um, but certainly in the areas of open access and monographs, I, th I think it's a time when things are changing quite rapidly. And it's really, I, I, I find it quite fun time to be involved in this type of thing. So let me tell you the sorts of things that we've been doing. Well, so just very quickly, um, Open Book Publishers, and I've got a little, little these flyers down here as well. So we're publishing um, uh, open access monographs in the humanities and social sciences, research monographs. I'll be in a little bit more detail later. Um, but monographs and digital humanities, this was the other thing that I was worried about. Usually when I talk to digital humanities type people, they hate monographs. And monographs are the bane of their lives. Um, and there's several reasons for that. Primarily, as far as I can understand, it's because they're analog. And you really cannot do all the things that you want to do with a monograph. Um, uh, they're paper, they're not digital, typically. Um, yeah, you can't interact with the readers and all this sort of stuff. You know, all the, all the things that you're wanting to do in digital humanities, you, apparently you can't do with a monograph. And the only reason that you do them is to get promoted, because if you don't do them, you'll never get promoted, and you'll never be put up for the ref. And therefore, that monograph is this sort of leftover, redundant thing that's imposed on you as an academic. Um, and so what I'd like to think about is what could the monograph be, and how how, you know, what can we do with it? How can we engage it? And possibly, how can we embrace it as a mechanism of dissemination? And so that's, that's what we're trying to play with, with at Open Book Publishers. We're trying to think, what can the monograph be? What do we need it to be doing? Uh, and how can academics engage with it usefully? So forget about promotions. Well, it's all for the love. If we really, really want to disseminate our stuff, if we really want to do good stuff, has the is, is, is the monograph useful to us? And if so, how could we engineer it to, to maximize that? And so those are the sorts of things that would be fun to worry about, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm clicking the wrong thing here. So I was trying to think, what is digital humanities? And, 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 and please excuse my... my uh, my attempts here, because, uh, uh, but there's a, there's a bunch of issues that I've come up with, which could be sort of digital humanities defined. One of them is, is purely a digitization process, that one's digitizing uh, a lot of physical material, be it books or, or video or films or, or whatever, but there's a digitization process there. Um, there's something about enhancing that, those, that digitized material, um, and we've got uh, um, uh, I, you know the sorts of things, but you know with metadata or, or semantic um, tags, etc. There's completely new research methods, as we saw uh, this morning, um, where completely different ways of conducting research, uh, and th and that that is. It's particularly exciting, I think, for, humani in, in, for the humanities, because this is a whole new way of discovering new material. And, and you know, we've heard CERN being talked about a few times. But you, know, you pick up a gravity wave, and it's pretty, pretty, pretty raw, and it's not saying very much. But you know that it's going to lead to lots of stuff in the future. And, and I think some of the things that we're picking up now are gravity waves. You know, they're, they're, you're picking them up. You're seeing that there's something there. But we don't quite know what these clouds mean. But, but that's the excitement. It's going to lead things, and, and there's, there's lots of things there. There's new methods for disseminating knowledge, and that's the area that I want to be concentrating on a little bit now, thinking about how to disseminate knowledge, what we need from dissemination, uh, what we can do with dissemination. And as I mentioned before, there's areas of the direct 
um, engagement with the readers. Um, and I keep pushing the wrong button here. So then I'm trying to think, well, what is a monograph? Uh, and, and so some of the features that I think I wanted to pull out from a monograph, clearly this would never handle as a definition, but the, here are some features. It is a means of disseminating some research findings. And I guess it's got a sort of textual base to it. So there's some sort of way of disseminating one's research findings, primarily textual. You know, it, it, it's not a film. It could be a film. Maybe it should be a film as well. But, but there's a textual component to that. The monograph has been used up till now um, as a as a primary way of structuring research in the humanities. So while a journal article is quite often just a writing up a result, a monograph for a lot of humanities scholars is actually the building block around which they conduct their research. And so it's got a bigger role here. It's, it's sort of directing, informing uh, the research. If the way, what, if, if what you can do with a monograph changes, then clearly the way that you can conduct your research changes as well. So there's a relationship here between the end product and your research process, which uh, I think we'll come back to a, a little bit more. But there's, a, there's an interaction there that we need to, to be engaged with uh, and, and, and what, what the role of the monograph is in that. It's a store of knowledge of, as, over time. I've got archiving there, but I think it's really important that, that a monograph or a book is, 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 is holding knowledge. Uh, both, it, it's, it's a sort of an identity, this is what was said at this time, and people can come back to it 100 years later, 200 years later, 500 years later, and it's like a time capsule of, of, of an idea, of a thought, and it it's, has survived in its, its, its entity as it was created. And I, 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 I don't think one wants to ditch that as an important object that, that we've got this, and it, I come down to the later one, that it's self-contained and portable, that there's something important in that, that you can put your idea, you can put those concepts together, and you can get hold of them in some way and say, look, that is, that's an entity which is, 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 is self-defining. I don't need to go to lots of other places to understand this entity, and I can carry it with me, and I can take it to places where I want to have it, rather than being constrained to going to it. And I, and, and I think that those are, those are issues that we, we want to be thinking about. Uh, it's also a means of discovering new research. So quite often people go to libraries and cruise, cruise the bookshelves and say, well, I, look what I found. Or, there's, or they're, they're looking at, at you know, Amazon's reading lists, or they're looking at uh, even the references within to other I identities. So it's a way of discovering material as well as just disseminating work. And again, that's something that I think we want to think about. Uh, and finally, since the beginning of the monograph, um, you've had different editions and formats for different readers. And so, you know, you've always had these big, you know, glossy formats that cost a huge amount, and you've had little paperbacks that you can flog off at railway stations. Uh, and, and there's been lots of things in between. So across time, different formats have been created to address different audiences. Uh, and that's also a, a, a facility that I don't think we probably want to ignore and if anything engage with even more. Okay, I keep still hitting this thing. Um, so what is a digital monograph? You can see that, you know, I, I don't know, got lots of questions, not particularly very many answers here. Um, so I think we'd probably want to think of a digital monograph a little bit more than just a digitized edition of a printed work. Now, clearly that is something. Uh, but the potential of a digital monograph is, is much bigger than that, just as the potential of digital humanities is bigger than the digitization process. The, the, 
the potential here is that we've got a digital object which can do all that a paper monograph could do and potentially a lot more. And, and maybe we should be looking, you know, thinking about how we could engage with that. Uh, and so I've got open access there. Now clearly open access is not a requirement for a digital object. Uh, but, I, but I'd like to argue, and I'll keep going on, that I think that it's really an important part of the potential of this idea of a digital monograph is that it's open access. And the reasons for that is that I think that you get far better dissemination and discovery like that. You allow reuse and engagement, social engagement a lot more. You facilitate social editing. I think there's a lot of potential that open access can provide that, that a closed access is denying that, that, that immediacy with, with the text, which is a big loss, I think. It can be multimedia. One can embed digital media into, you know, a, a video is no different to text, which is no different to a picture, which is no different to a three-dimensional cloud diagram that can spin and, and we can look at it from lots of different ways. These are all just digital objects which can be embedded into a digital object. So that's not a problem. Uh, <clears throat> we can also embed links. There, links to data, which is great, links to websites, links to, to other resources that are available. There's a big difference between those two things and it's all to do with whether or not your final digital object is self-contained or not. If you're, if you're linking to other places, then you have a real problem down the line of sustaining the integrity of the research. Because not only do you have to make sure that the place that you link, link to is sustained, but you also have to make sure that the link itself is sustained. And so there's a whole bunch of issues there about how do you maintain the integrity of the idea when you break it away from being a self-contained object. Now, lots of things can be done with that and, and there'd be ways around that, but it's something that one needs to think about when one's talking about this, you know, the integrity of the idea that you're putting forward and whether people can really engage with your thesis in the way that you want them to can come out in many, many more formats. So it's not just hardback and paperback and big and small print. Uh, so here are some of the ways that at, at Open Book, some of the different formats that, that we, are we, we generate as just part of, part, of the, part of the process. You know, we have printed both hardback and paperback. We have PDFs, we have EPUBs, we have Mobis, we have HTML, XML. Okay, I know XML includes lots of other stuff that is on the list. Um, but, you know, we've got WordPress, we've got Wikitext, we've got Word, we've got InDesign, we've got a, 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 a thing called Binu, which is used by one of the, one of the uh, telephone um, book reader that we've got. We've got LaTeX, we heard about Wolf's, uh, Wolfram, it was doing something at that Oxford, um, but Mathematica is there, we've got IPython. You know, th th it's, it's, it's this huge array of different formats. And just as we heard earlier, these different formats all do different things. And they all give different potential. And so printed works are really great if you want to, if you want to write notes in the margin, you want to do things, you want to bend it over, and, and lots of people like printed works. PDFs are good for lots of reasons that EPUBs aren't good for, and vice versa. Similarly, if you want to embed code in a program that runs, you know, things like IPython and Mathematica are really good news for that. And so once again, there's lots and lots of different versions that can do different things, present different things to different audiences in different ways. And I think we can, we can look as academics to engage with that positively and think, you know, let's think of all the things, all the different people that we want to engage with and how to engage with them. And finally, there is something possibly, maybe, with a question mark, about a linear structure about a monograph that there's something that the author is, is leading the audience through, the set of arguments. Um, uh, and, and a lot of the formats that I've said there, EPUB, Mobi, um, HTML, XML even, um, WordPress, we, ha have all got a structure to them. Um, but it's not a necessarily a unique structure. There's lots of different ways of reforming things and coming up with a new structure. And in a digital world, you can create a new edition. Now, whether you call that lots of different ways of going through the same content or lots of different contents, it, 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 that sounds to me like a sort of definitional thing. 
certainly I can mix and match digital contents in lots and lots of different ways and recreate them in lots of different formats to be engaged in with different audiences. And that's something, again, that, that's a huge power that we have in our dissemination process that didn't exist before. Okay, so having said all, <coughs> all of that, um, can, I, can I link onto the internet? Will that do it? Okay. Okay, so this is sort of, let me get rid of this. this is, so this is our, our site very quickly. Um, uh, can I get rid of that? There we go. Um, and, 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 and what have we got? We've got a whole bunch of books there, uh, uh, which, which look pretty much like images of books. Um, so we've, we've published about 76 titles so far, primarily in the humanities and social sciences. We've had, had um, we'll, we'll have our millionth reader during the summer at some point, so we look forward to that. Um, readers from all over the world, 400 readers per title per month is what we're averaging. So I just, I just throw that down and when we talk about dissemination, and we'll have another look at that as well, most of the legacy printed works are getting sales of about 400 in their lifetime. We're getting about 400 a month. So if you think that a printed work stays in print for maybe 10 years, that means we're getting about two orders of magnitude more readers than you would expect to get from a legacy publisher. Um, it, do, it does sort of doubt the claim that nobody's interested in my book. A lot of academics will say there's only 12 people in the entire world who understand what it is that I'm saying. So it doesn't matter that nobody else had access because they couldn't have understood what I was saying anyway. Um, uh, and clearly there's certainly a lot of people who want to try uh, and they're being, they're being denied the attempt uh, uh, under the existing model. Um, if you go to one of our books, um, uh, then, hopefully, uh, i just quickly point out some of the things that are there. Um, you can see that we've got multiple editions here. Um, so this is uh, a book that came out a little while ago, um, uh, authored by a whole bunch of um, uh, pretty well-known humanities-type people, but head by Gordon Brown, the ex-Prime Minister. Um, paperback, hardback, PDF, EPUB, and Mobi. So those are pretty standard there. Um, let me just explain what's, what's going on here. We've also got a PDF edition that you just can click on here uh, and read as a, as, a, as, a, as a version that you can, you know, it looks, it looks like a book, doesn't it? You know, and you can sort of click on things and go places and etc. cetera. Um, uh, We've also got an HTML edition, which is also free to read and download, and you can, you can, you can cut and paste it and, and et cetera. Um, uh, and I just point out, uh, just here, because I'll come back to it, the, the paperback and the hardback we sell, and the EPUB, uh, in this case the PDF is free to download, uh, the EPUB and the Mobi for everybody outside of King's College and a few other places, uh, costs a pound. Yeah, that's quite a cheap one. Some of the places, it's a little bit more than that. We do charge for the EPUB and the, and the Mobi in most cases, and I can talk about why that is. But we have a system, a uh, library membership system, which King's has been a member of, um, which means that everybody can download all of those, all those editions as well for free. So the, the, these two editions are, if you like, this HTML is, if you like, the open access edition. It's free text. It can be downloaded. It can be cut and paste it. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, uh, we've got a reader there, and we've got a bunch of other uh, versions that are right there. Um, we can look at <clears throat> this type of thing as well and see, well, this book has been, this was published at the start of the month. This has been viewed 2,700 2, times, and we can go and look and see where abouts those viewers came from. Uh, and, and you can see that 793 came from the United States. Maybe you can see this better than I. I don't have my glasses on, so I might be making these numbers up. Um, 484 or something from here, uh, eight from Russia. You know, so you can see where these readers are coming from. Um, okay, so where does that get me? I'm going to go back to this, I guess. Maybe there was another way to do that. Oh, look at that. 
Okay? So that's what it is. So that's, so have a look at, so the first is, what I wanted to say was I think we reach far, far, far more readers all around the world than you would under a typical monograph. So if, if in humanities we're trying to say that we relate to people and that people might be interested in what we're doing, then this is one way of letting people know what it is we're doing. And here's the sort of the evidence that I was giving for 400 um, readers per title. You can see how the, what the readership is um, by the year of publication per month um, over the last year. Uh, and you can see there's a difference between a mean and a median, which is also going to be important to worry out. So our mean is 426, our median is 283. So three to 400 readers. Um, but across time, you can see there's not a real big fall off here. Uh, you know, cut out 2012, this is one particular book, uh, which we can talk about. But, but um, uh, there hasn't been that fall off in readership. The books that were published in 2009 are still attracting 300 odd readers a month. Uh, and that's a very different profile than some, the readership that you get, or certainly sales data that one gets from legacy publishing routes. So people are, are really engaged um, over a period of time with the work. Comes back to having this work, having a capsule that says, look, this is work, is there, you can engage with it, and it stays there over time. Okay. Um, online readers by year and by platform. So the other thing that you can do with open access is you can make sure that your book is available in lots of different places. So you can see that the most readers to our book are actually come from Google Books. This is the blue line down here. So Google Books is hugely important as bringing, bringing people to the work. They're finding it on Google Books, a lot of them, and they're reading the Google Books version. Uh, the, the red and the green, that's our PDF reader and our HTML reader. So that's our, that's the, 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 our own website. Oh, and that little purple bit at the top there. So that adds up to about the same as Google Books. So we're getting about as many people on our own website as we get through Google Books. And there's lots of other places out there as well. So this here is a, a site called Open Edition. We've got Classics Library, which is a website I might talk about later as well. It's a website for classics teachers because we've got a couple of classics books. Um, we've got uh, World Reader, which is a telephone. Uh, all the books are streamed on telephones primarily in Africa. Uh, and so they can be read for free on a mobile telephone. That's World Reader. We've got Wiki, Wikimedia, we, so we, our books are on Wiki, Wikiversity and, and uh, etc. Some of our books. So the other thing that I want to just point out here though is that it's that breadth, that, you know, our books are being hosted in lots and lots of different places. And all of those places are attracting a different audience. And so that's something that one wants to think about if you're disseminating work is, is that you've got to get the work to the people as well as hoping that the people will come to the work. But you've got to get it to where the people are. And just having it on your website as a PDF on your website or even as a very sophisticated digital humanities program on your website is probably not enough because people are not going to find your website. You need to be able to be thinking about how to put it out to other places as well to get people to be able to find it. By country, you can see that most of our readers are in the United States and, and the United Kingdom. Just le but that's less than half. So that's a very different picture than you'd see from a, a typical legacy sales. And it's not that surprising. We're doing academic. We publish pretty rigorous academic works. Uh, um, our main audience, in English, uh, our main audience is going to be UK and US. You wouldn't be surprised by that. But Greece is number three, India number four. You know, it, the, 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 it's being engaged with in, in, in lots of different places. And our most active work, uh, our biggest, <clears throat> uh, that, that big red blob on 2012 that we saw before is a book called Oral Literature in Africa, which is authored by an open, open university uh, professor, uh, Ruth Finnegan. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and it's been accessed just over 100,000 times since we published it. Uh, the country which has accessed it the most in all the world is Kenya. Uh, the continent that has accessed it more is Africa. That beats North America, that beats Europe, 
Uh, and so you put stuff out open access, you get it to people that are interested. Uh, and, 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 okay. Now one of the things we, we I was talking to Willa just before, one, one of the things that I, I find <coughs> interesting is, as I said, when people come to our website, um, if you come from King's or you come from any of the universe, uh, of the libraries that have, have become members, you can read the PDF on our reader, you can read the HTML, you can download a PDF, you can download an EPUB, you can download a Mobi, it's all for free. So the interesting thing is what do people do when they're presented with that amount of choice? What do people actually do? So this is a set, this is, I've just taken out people that came to our website from universities where everything was free. And 70% of them went to that PDF reader. Now that interests me because that's the most, that's the, that's the most traditional and the less interact, least interactive of all the things you could possibly do. Yeah, it reproduces what looks like a book in digital format. But actually, 70% of the people want to do that. They don't even want to download it. Only 6% of people downloaded the free editions of the work in any format from our website. Most people were looking uh, and moving on, looking, moving on, reading bits, going, possibly coming backwards and forwards. I don't know, you know, if I download it, I, I probably never see them again. If they don't download it, it could be that they come back a month later or two months later and I wouldn't be able to pick those up as, as the same person coming back. So there could be distortions there. But, but, and the HTML, which is possibly more interactive um, than, than, than the others, is, is not being heavily used. I mean, 25%. It's, it's it's one in four, but it's 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 the uh, and so it comes back to all these different versions. Different people want to engage with the work in different ways. They're looking for different things out of the work, uh, and so one needs to be able to. If you're disseminating your ideas, you need to be able to give it to people in ways that they can interact with. Okay, um, how am I? I'm probably running out of time. Um, we've still got what is it? 15 minutes? Have I? Is it? 45 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so um, better dissemination. Open access, the sort of digital monographs, I think, have, have got better dissemination. Um, broader geographic reach. Uh, different reader demographic, I think. Uh, it's hard to know that, and we're trying to do a study, but I, I suspect that a lot of the people that are accessing our work are not from academic communities, uh, and that they're coming through from, from interested non-academics, um, but I have no proof for that. Uh, we're trying to get that at present. Um, and, re and, and reuse. Um, one of the things that, uh, well, we'll come back to reuse. Um, by having an open access, I think we are able to reuse the works in, in ways that give people a lot more flexibility. Okay, how does this all enable us to do better research? Clearly, the linking, uh, being able to link the research directly to the repositories, being able to link directly to databases, being able to link back to archives, being able to, uh, this is not embedding, this is just linking. This is just saying, listen, here's my thesis, but here is where the data comes from. Here's my thesis, here is where you can go to, to, to test that. That sort of interaction, I think, is something that a digital book does really, can do really well. With the proviso, and the thing that we really have to think about in the future, is that those links need to be sustained for as long as the book is to really get the good value of that. So we really need to be thinking about how to, how to ensure that. We can embed multimedia content. Uh, as I said before, it can be all sorts of things that we embed. Uh, We've got free range to embed music, and we'll, I'll quickly look at some examples of music and videos and things where we've done that. Um, social editing, by having an open access, we can allow social editing both pre-publication and post-publication. And both of those are interesting, different dynamics that one, one could th can think about uh, with a monograph. Um, and of course, the reuse, uh, different ways of doing things, different, different ways of negotiating one's way through the material, uh, different 
research techniques as they're discovered, uh, making sure that the material is accessible to allow the developments of different ways of interacting with them. Uh, so I want to give a couple of examples uh, of some of the works. So one of them is, um, is this. Maybe this will work. Um, maybe this has worked. I mean, I'll hold my breath a little bit. But it comes back to links and about embedding the work and, and linking to the work. And when it's embedded, I can be pretty certain it would work. And when it's linked, well, you never know. It might be done that day. It could be changing. It could be there, there's other things going on. That's, a, that's a, something deep that we have to get at. I, I certainly haven't got my head fully around, but we're experimenting with. Um, okay, so this is a, a translation of Dietrich Romeo's nephew. Um, it's a beautiful translation. It's a wonderful translation by a couple of scholars up in Oxford. Um, uh, but that's only the start of it. The editor uh, wanted to, really felt that if you wanted to understand this work, you had to understand the references to the people and the music that is within the work. And a lot of the people weren't well understood, and a lot of the music was completely unknown. And so she went to Pascal Duc at the uh, Conservatoire of Music in Paris and said, hey, would you guys play, would you guys record the music for this book? So he recorded the mu a whole bunch of music tracks which are completely inaccessible anywhere else. And, and with, a, with a bunch of students had a project, they produced effectively an album. And the album is embedded into this book. Yeah, and we can have a look, but we've got little footnotes that say here's a reference to the music we can go through and we can, we can, um, uh, so I can, I guess I can do it on this one. I can, uh, I can uh, go through. No, I'll probably skip to the. I need to find a little musical. There we go. There's a little musical footnote. So I can click on that musical footnote. I can go to an end note in which there's a bit of a description about what it is and who the author was. And then I can, I can click on there in this case. Um, and I can try and shut that up. Um, I, can, I can link through. In that case, it was YouTube. In other case, in the PDF, it's embedded within. And I can have the music there and... Uh, uh, you can also see that we've got lots and lots of other footnotes in here, which are biographical information about the various people that are, that are there as well. So here's a situation where one can jump to and from. We can expect the reader to be engaging with the music and to be able to understand how the music fits into the argument that's there. Uh, similarly, we have musicology books where, uh, where you're studying the musical playing techniques of different people uh, or the same person over time of exactly the same piece of music. Uh, we can embed that into the work so that it sits alongside the analysis. So you can hear the snippet that's actually, or the snippets that are being analyzed. And you can, you can say, you, 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 you know, is this, is this valid? There's the music. You know, is this a valid argument? There's not some description going on. It's the music there. Or we can embed videos from, from anthropology works in which uh, uh, we've got a few books on storytelling. Um, which was probably back here. Uh, storytelling in Northern Zambia has got a whole bunch of videos embedded in it of the stories being told because it's really important, not just the words that were said, but how they said it and how they engaged with the audience. You can put the video into the work and then uh, the author gets a bit, oh, geez, you know what happened? People write into me and sell, tell me that I misinterpreted that hand gesture. You know, that's scholarship. That's what it's all about. He misinterpreted, and it was the people could only tell him because he gave them the material with which to be able to understand that. Um, I got another book here, Land of the Romanovs. So the land, of, this is a book, um, this is a, a professor in Cambridge who had put together a incredible bibliography of all the works, first-hand English language accounts of the Russian Empire for the reign of the Ro Romanovs, you know, 1613 to 1917. This is, this is every single thing that he'd come across in his entire life just as he was retiring. 
Not only that, not as easy as he identified them, he's got his notes annotated about what he thought about them and what it said. And it's, a, it's an incredible piece of scholarship. It's not, it's not real easy reading, you know, it's, uh, but as a piece of scholarship, it's fantastic. So what we've been able to do, as well as do everything else, is throw that up on, onto, onto Wikiversity. And so here it is here on Wikiversity, and now it's a socially editable version. So not only is this just a printed paper work and it can sit on a bookshelf and in 50 years time it'll still be sitting on the bookshelf, here it is now, it's actually a research tool because people can go in, they can add to it, they can put links through to the digitized versions of it, they can engage with it, they can do lots of other things with this work. So instead of it just being a book, it's actually a it's become a fundamental research for anybody who wants to be, research tool for anybody who wants to work in those areas. Uh, okay. Um, another one which I won't click through to, but this is what works in conservation. So this is again a, 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 a huge site in which uh, um, Bill Sutherland and a few others have created a, a fantastic website which is trying to summarize all the academic literature about environmental policy, direct environmental policy. Does planting hedgerows protect hedgehogs? You know, that's a question which, which you know, quite a few councils might be interested in. But you know what? They don't have time to go to all the literature and dig out what's been happening and what the evidence is for a plus or minus. So they've got a website that does that for them. Fantastic website. What we've been able to do is bring a book out that sits sort of at the top of a pyramid of information so that, that book can be taken hold of and engaged with because that's how a lot of readers want to engage with the work. But it provides links through to a cascade of different types of information. So you can get the summaries and then you can link through to more detailed analysis and then you can actually link through to the, at least links to the papers, most of which are behind paywalls so you won't be allowed to read those. But, but you've got this sort of cascade of information which, which a dissemination tool is to bring out something, a, a, a format, in this case a, a monograph, both in printed and in various digital formats, to bring your readers in, in the way that they want to engage with it, and then lead them into a much broader understanding of what's going on, if they want to go that way. Um, finally, we, we just introduced a thing called um, OBP Customized. So, what this enables a reader to do is to mix and match across any of the content that they want and create their own book or their own EPUB or anything else that they want. So they can look at our content and mix and match it, put it in different orders, write their own introduction, add material from other places. It, 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 you know, you've got that flexibility to be able to do all these other things with the content. It's all open access, so uh, it's, it's easy to do. Mix and match it and then create the work that you wish we'd done. Yeah, but we didn't, because we didn't know you wanted that. Yeah, but you know you want that, so you tell us and it can be created. Uh, and it's again, allowing lots of different ways of interacting with the material and let, giving the reader a little bit more control in saying what is it, you know, what's the format that we would like to be having this information presented to us. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time, I could talk about um, business models briefly, um, but a, a really critical thing is is making sure that one has a sustainable. Uh, we've heard it from James has gone, but uh, you know, having a sustainable project, and and so luckily, that's what we are. We're a non-profit. We started up as a non-profit, um, and uh, uh, and and we're not making a profit. <laughs> Uh, but we're not making a loss either, and so, and so that's uh, that's that's um, a big point. The, the key part of our business model is to keep costs down. Uh, and so there's been a study that was done in the in the U.S. that it's costing uh, U.S. liberal arts universities that have their own presses it's costing them about thirty thousand dollars per monograph to produce a monograph. There's James. He's up there. I was saying he'd gone. He'd gone way up the back there. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, so you know, here's our costs. Here are our total. This is total cost. This is our cost divided by the number of titles. Is six and a half thousand. A quarter of that is to do with distribution and sales. 
which we, if we didn't do, we wouldn't have to pay. Um, so as far as the setup here, overheads and title setup, these, these are costs that have been brought all a long way down. I mention it because one of the real other things about publishing is that once the book is out there, once this entity has identified, we can send it out and we don't have any further costs to the maintenance of it. And that's a really big difference between that and the website. Because the website we have to maintain. And so as far as dissemination about putting things out there, about the self-contained entity, it's a fantastically efficient way of maintaining that knowledge in that format because it doesn't have this on, on ongoing running cost. And I think that's something that one needs to really think through, especially in some of the digital humanities projects that we've been working with. It, the end result has been a website, which is fantastic, but it needs maintenance. And so thinking about ways that one can get that knowledge to be done in ways that can sit without that cost is, 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 is I think, something to engage with. Um, there's our revenue I can talk about, um, conclusions, well, there we are. Uh, I'm not allowed to hype. Possibly I've done too much hype, so I won't even read my conclusions. So, yeah, I, I certainly I don't want to put that across. I think that the printed work has got huge advantages in lots and lots of areas and it'll stick around for a long time. But I think that digital has got some opportunities as well, which paper isn't so good at, at delivering. Uh, and that we shouldn't walk away, you know, it's not either or, as you say. They, they sit, they're complementary, as we heard um, earlier, they're complementary publications. You just need to be careful who it is that you're wanting to address with each of those. So our printed works are about 1% of our, of our audience. Um, now that's, an, I think, an important 1%, but it is 1%, and 99% of the audience are engaging in other ways. Um, and, but we do make some efforts, like for instance, as far as music, it's, it's difficult to embed music into a printed work. Um, but what we do do is we create QR codes so that you can scan on your telephone, you can scan the link so that your telephone can play you the music even if your book won't do it. Uh, now, that, but that has two components with it which are weaknesses. We still need to have the place that is delivering, you know, QR, QR codes need to be recognized in the future. The place that's streaming it needs to be there in the future, and the link between them needs to be there in the future. So it's a weakness that, you know, at least I, oh, I, I don't quite know how to get over that weakness at present, but I'm hoping that technology will help us in, in sustaining those connections. Very much about And that's why printed, you know, does that so well. This is one thing we really have to worry about. Talk about sustainability. We need to think of the century. Not exactly right. And so, just, uh, no, I'm going way over time. But, so what we have done, just by the by, as far as the links are concerned, we've tried to use DOIs. In that DOI has got a sort of potential 
of some sort of ongoing process with it. And it gives us the flexibility to control the links at the end of the DOI. So therefore, the, what we're putting into that printed work can survive, even if the point that it, the, the site that it changes, that it points to, we can change. So there are ways of trying to, to connect those, but we have to think about them much more seriously, and we need to be thinking about how to archive all that other material in, in ways that can be streamed. Um, but it, it, you know, the, the right problems to have. You know, if nobody, it, 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 it's, it's exciting because you can do this stuff and then you think, damn it, how are we going to keep that together, you know? <laughs> and that's what we need to be doing as a, as a community is thinking, you know, how, how, how can we engage, how can we solve these problems? Uh, because they're really critical, absolutely critical to work on everything.